Man, I'm so glad you guys are here today. Uh, we, uh, we know that one of the best ways to determine the spiritual health of a church is by a show of hands survey. So let's have a little bit of honesty this morning. Uh, how many people got into Christmas music and decorations after Thanksgiving? Raise your hands. And how many people, you can put them down, how many people got into Christmas music and Christmas decorations before Thanksgiving? I don't even know what to say, except good on you. You got a head start. Christmas season is underway. Whether you like it or not, whether you are ready for it or not, Christmas season is upon us. We got snow already. I, I, here's the thing. I, I, th I feel like the more people I talk to, the more people I agree with. Snow is actually kind of cool before Christmas, right? After Christmas, you can keep it, man. But before Christmas... You know, we're just adding to the directory. There's just something about the anticipation in our hearts. We got our snow. There's a, there's a clear uptick in the air of Nat King Cole and Michael Buble and like one song from Mariah Carey, but I guess that's enough for some people. <laughs> it's all happening. Hallmark movies are holding us captive to their unforeseen plot twists <laughs> and <laughs> surprise endings and... It's really the most wonderful time of the year, the most wonderful time of the year. But what if I told you that the most wonderful life that you can have uh, does not have to be reserved to uh, a movie or a song or a season? What if I told you that God has been moving in your life and that nothing that God does can be stopped and that everything he does is good? good for him and it's going to be good for you. Jesus said a line once that we're going to track down in just a little bit. I'll just quote him for now, but it's a, it's a line. I'm curious if you've heard him say this before. Uh, Jesus said once to a whole lot of people, I've come so that they may have life and have it to the full. How many people heard, have heard that line before from Jesus? I'm going to show you in the Bible where that's from. Jesus said, I've come so that they may have life, they may have it to the full. And that line from Jesus is an invitation to you. And that invitation will be the foundation of the series that we've begun called It's a Wonderful Life. When, when the Christmas season comes, this is when we celebrate when Jesus came, right? When Jesus showed up. Why Jesus showed up, that will change your life. You, in the life that you live, you having a life of purpose, you having a life of power, you having something real to believe in, something uh, uh, hopeful to hang on to, that all begins, that all becomes real when you have Jesus. And that's what we're devoting the next few Sundays to, exploring this together as we celebrate Jesus' birth. And we're going to start today by talking about you having a life that is purposeful, Purposeful. So God's word is going to have something for everybody today. But I, I specifically want you to know, I think you're going to be encouraged today if lately you have been feeling achy with this idea that nothing that you do matters. If you've ever find yourself struggling with disinterest or apathy, uh, if you feel like you have simply stopped caring about the outcome of events, if you are seeing that the things that used to bring you joy actually kind of ring hollow now and it just feels empty, if you've been sensing hopelessness or even like a depression about your future, then it's possible that you've been running empty, running on empty on a sense of purpose in your life. And Jesus' invitation into a wonderful life for you, that won't run empty on purpose. That is a purposeful life. Let me show you where we're going to be today. We're going to be in the book of John, okay? So if you know where the difference between Old and New Testament in your Bible, go ahead and grab that right now. Go probably to the beginning of the New Testament. And New Testament starts off with Matthew, and then it goes Mark, Luke, John. If you get to Acts and Romans, you went a little too far. We're going to go to the book of John, 
And we're going to look at the opening words of the gospel of John. And as you're finding that, we're also going to put this on the screen. It says, in the beginning was the word. And it might be capitalized in your Bible, word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made, and without him, Nothing was made that has been made. This is such an interesting way for a guy, John, to start off his gospel. What's a gospel? Best understanding of the word gospel from scripture is good news. And we share the gospel. At the same time, we entitle the written account of the life and times of Jesus as a gospel as well. John, this guy, was an eyewitness to all of those things. And so gospel in the Bible always means good news. That's what the life of Jesus always brings everybody. Good news. And so if you've been around a Bible or even you're flipping through a Bible right now, you have may notice that there's more than the gospel of John. There's also the gospel of Matthew and the gospel of Mark and the gospel of Luke as well. What's the deal there? This is the same good news story of the spectacular life lived by Jesus, all from slightly different personal perspectives and overlapping conclusions, but still all about Jesus. However, John starts his gospel in a unique way compared to the others. Not, not, not better or worse, just different. Well, what's the uniqueness? John doesn't start Jesus' story like the other guys did. The other guys started their story with people Real, like real life people having conversations with angels and, uh, and, and, and with, a, with a pregnant virgin teenage girl and a, and, a, and a barn scene with a manger filled with hay and baby. Like this was all Matthew, Mark, Luke. How does John start his gospel? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And he was with God in the beginning and through him, all things were made, and without him, nothing was made that has been made. You know what we're looking at here? A huge declaration about the greatness of Jesus. Jesus is so great, he existed before he was a baby. Who else can say that? In fact, the immediate readers of what's being written here, uh, you, could, you could divide into two groups, Jews and non-Jews. And any Jewish audience member, any Jewish person who heard this read would immediately in their mind go all the way back to the first lines of the Bible you hold that they brought you. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God said, he spoke It might seem weird to us, but to a Jewish audience member, there's this common understanding about this title because God's words create life. God said, let there be light, and then there was light. Life comes from the word of God. And John gives Jesus this title. He is the word. Maybe you weren't Jewish. Maybe you were, maybe you were a Gentile. Maybe in that time you're a, you know, you're a Greek student. And you, so you see how John wrote this word, which in Greek would be logos. And they would, they would more focus on, well, what does a word do? Well, what does a word mean? The fact of the matter is that spoken words always express the minds of its speaker, right? And it, this is a fitting title for Jesus. Because the life of Jesus fully expresses the mind of God to us in ways that we intuitively understand. It's a fitting title for Jesus because in this one single life that was given to us, this this human life with hair and bones and skin, this, this human life that came with genuine emotions and expressions, in this single life, Everything that heaven wanted to say to us was delivered to us in the word. So this is how John introduces Jesus, his friend. 
his Lord to the world. Jesus, the one who was always with God because Jesus is God, and it was always that way even from the beginning of all things. Now, we do celebrate Jesus' birth into the human race, or here's the word we use, the incarnation on Christmas, during the Christmas season. We pegged it as December 25. Scholars will say it was probably sometime in the spring, so I don't know how we got that wrong, but it's a nice way to end the year, right? So we, we celebrate his birth into the human race. That is the moment in time and space when Jesus became Mary's kid, right? But And here's a theology term for you, the pre-incarnate Christ. So the Bible's going to be honest with you, even though it is a mind bender, the pre-incarnate Christ always was the son of God from the very beginning. And when you and I talk about this idea of purpose, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? And what are the dreams that I want to chase? And what am I even here for? When we want to talk about purpose, the first thing we are best off doing is realizing that if such a thing exists, and you know people who don't think it exists, but if such a thing exists, it existed first in the intentions and the desires of the creator. That's where purpose comes from. Why? He got here first. He made it all. These are the ideas we're getting into as John starts the story of Jesus. He continues. Look at the next verse, verses 4 and 5. John continues. In him, who? The word. In Jesus, in the word, was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You know what fascinates me about these lines in the purpose conversation is that in a span of just a few opening verses, we have gone from acknowledging that if there's any purpose behind anything in the galaxies, it lies first in the intentions and the desires of a creative God. And by the time we get through verse 5, we are learning how a purpose-filled life of the Son of God informs the purpose in your life and in my life. Think about it this way. What good is a spoken word if no one is there to hear it? Think about it. Pick the word. But if there's no one to hear the word, if there's no one there to receive the word or consider it or be moved by it, what good is it? Why make a word? Why call it a word? Well, it's the same thing is true with word with a capital W. John calls him the word because from the beginning, there was a purpose for it to be spoken to us. God has made us an important part of his story. He's got center stage, and he's giving us an important part of his narrative. That means that you and I, we members of mankind together, whatever purpose you and I are going to find in our retirement, in our high school years, in every age and stage of our lives, whatever purpose you and I are going to experience, we are going to experience it faster if we search him out rather than continue to search ourselves out. John told us his life was the light of men. His life was the searchlight of men for each and every, pers- for each and every person. We have no such luck if he just stays in heaven and that word is unspoken to us. Then we stay essentially in the darkness. But that's what Jesus came down to us for. For we who are in the dark and we're willing willing to admit it, willing to trust him through it. He came so we could find our way. Nobody helps you learn what's what in your life better than Jesus. And that is what the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the co-equal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, that's what he can do for you. And that was always the plan. Understand this about Christmas. Let it bend your mind a little bit. That Jesus coming to us was not like an afterthought. 
It wasn't like a plan B that God slapped together because things like threaded apart in the Garden of Eden. They're like, oh, they're shocked, you know. Like, what are we going to do? I guess I could go, oh, I don't know, let's talk about it, you know, whatever. That's, that's not how an eternal God works. The truth is for the moment, from the moment that sin entered, through the, entered the world in the Garden of Eden, in the beginning, in Genesis, what we have is Genesis chapter 3. Throughout history, there was always a promise to the Jews of a Messiah, word translated into Greek, New Testament readers, a Christ was going to come all the way through history, all the way to the moment of a miraculous birth of little eight pound, six ounce newborn baby Jesus, all the way through his life, all the way through his ministry, even through his death on the cross to cover our sins, all of that foretold by a mind boggling number of prophecies and all of that leading us to where our Bible runs out. And the end is actually the beginning of all new things. When you read in the last few pages of Revelation where Jesus, who has long since conquered death, he's ascended into heaven, that Jesus is going to return for all those who have placed their faith in him, they've surrendered to him, he's going to gather all those people up and we're going to be reunited and together with him forever in heaven. And on a future day, Jesus is going to stand up, and he ain't even going to be bashful about it. He's going to say, I'm the Alpha, and I'm the Omega. I'm the beginning, and I'm the end. Why can he say that? Well, because from the beginning and through the end, Jesus has been there. He is the framework behind the universe. Jesus is that great. And he wants you to experience purpose by bringing you into a relationship with God because you can't have life to the full without him. Now, we said that we were gonna chase that line, right? So if you're flipping in your Bibles and you're in John 1, turn a few pages. Uh, let's go to John chapter 10. This is where John is continuing his gospel. He's de describing a moment when Jesus gives himself a title for the aid of the people who are listening, for the aid of people like you and me. And he says, I am the good shepherd. Maybe you've heard him say that before in John, John chapter 10 is where that's recorded. He says, I am the good shepherd. And we need to talk about him being a good shepherd. But the, the part that's usually lost on us is the I am part, which his Jewish audience would have recognized as him making yet another claim to everything you and I have been sort of unfolding over the last 10 minutes. That I am goes straight back to Exodus when, when God told Moses from a burning bush, I am what I am. That's, you, that's what you can tell people, that I'm beyond your description. I always was, always will be. There's no past, present, or future. I'm outside of all that. And when Jesus would make an I am station, uh, statement, he was pointing to that. He said, I am the good shepherd. But he said good shepherd because he was comparing himself to the other kinds of shepherding voices in the culture, in society, that would push and pull on people's desires, push and pull on people's futures, that would claim to be a coaching voice. I mean, if you just scroll through your, your uh, you know, Instagram right now, isn't it amazing how many people know what you should bake tomorrow, you know? And, you know, they, they're it's totally attuned to all of your hip mobility issues and how these three simple things that you would do every time you wake up in the morning, like there's so much coaching, there's so many voices out there that know what you should buy and how you should raise your kids, where you should move, who you should vote for. And Jesus is saying, look, I'm the good shepherd. He's comparing himself to all those other shepherding voices that will compete for your attention, but ultimately deliver you a meaningless life. Any other shepherd than Jesus essentially aims to be a thief of the life that God created and gave you and always designed for him to run. That's where we are in John chapter 10, and that's why Jesus says, hey, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Hey, there's our line. We said we were looking for that line. That's where it comes from. This is John 10, 10. And in Greek, for him to say have it to the full 
the, the Greek word there where we get like full or abundant life or life to the full, the Greek word there is parison, and it means exceedingly, abundantly, like way more than a person could ever, ever in a thousand years anticipate. Kind of like for whatever reason, you're inspired to clean out the couch cushions and you're like, whoa, you know what I'm talking about, especially those of you kids. Whoa, there's Legos, there's, there's spoons, there's more cereal than a college campus cafeteria. Like, what's, wow, there's a remote, a TV that we don't even have anymore. It's like, I couldn't have even imagined all the treasures. There's my 10 millimeter socket, you family. It's, 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 just, it's just all in there. You, just, you don't even know what you're going to find. And, and Jesus is saying, life with me is like unreasonably better. The life I want to give you, unreasonably better than anything you could imagine. And when you look at that, you look at that verse, put that verse up, John 10, 10. When you look at that verse, I want you to know, you can put your name where you see the word they. All right? You haven't said your name loudly in this room for a long time. Now, haven't you? I'm going to give you a shot. I'll read it. You fill in they. All of us on the count of three. Ready? Uh, let's see. Not on the count of three. I'm going to read it, and let's see if you can do it. I have come so that Justin may have life. And have it to the full. That is true for you if it's true for anybody. Now, when we look at a verse like this, you also got to know it's got a little, I don't want to say this verse has baggage. It's not God's fault. Um, but we've sort of attached baggage to a verse like this because it has often been twisted to convince people, hey, you know what life to the full means? It means that you are destined to be rich. Life to the full means you're going to be wealthy, you're going to be prosperous. Life to the full means no more difficulty for you if you start to follow Jesus. It's an always happy life. It's a no glitches, no pain life. And I just want you to know, that's just not true. Uh, it actually makes no sense when the Bible also describes all the people who initially followed Jesus. And we watch how their lives went. Their lives were not necessarily wealthy or prosperous. They had plenty of glitches and pen, plenty of pain. Most all of the disciples of Jesus were in some way, shape, or form martyred for their faith. They died for what they spoke of. Given the opportunity, however, they wouldn't turn back for all of the earthly comforts or promises given them in, in the world. Life to the, that's what life to the full looks like. It's not defined by typical earthly metrics. What about Jesus himself? Was, was that idea that life to the full was a wealthy, prosperous, glitch-free, pain-free life? Is that what you saw in the life of Jesus? Not at all. No, a more biblical way to understand the full life, the wonderful life that Jesus came to bring you is that it is exceedingly, it is abundantly greater than you could have ever anticipated. It's just not defined by temporary earthly measures. It's defined by endless heavenly descriptions and measures. There's a few chapters later where you see, we're gonna hear Jesus saying, now this is eternal life. This is eternal life. This is heaven on earth. What is? Well, that they know you, God. Jesus is praying in that moment, if you read the context. He, he says that they know you, the only true God and Jesus, whom you have sent. And yes, that they, that's you. Read it again. Put your name in there. Jesus says, life to the full is a life of wide open access to God. It's two things here. It's connection and intimacy with the creator of the universe. And two, life to the full is stepping onto the bridge that gets you across. The bridge that gets you across from a broken earth you know, earth drifting away from God and stepping over to the assurance of a forever home in heaven, a forever place with God's family, a life of not having God's 
creative heart to be a mystery of your own. And that bridge, life to the full, is actually stepping onto that bridge, walking into that adventure, and that bridge is not an it. Can you see it in the verse? John 17, 3? That bridge is not an it. The bridge is a who. It's him. It's Jesus Christ. Kelly Needham wrote a book recently. A friend referred it to me. It looks great. It's called Purposeful. And there's a key line in here that I really feel like represents all that we're talking about. She wrote, if you want a life of transcendent meaning and purpose, we don't need to look inward. We need to look upward. I mean, doesn't that really kind of throw a net around all of these ideas? That if you want your heart to actually rest for a change, knowing that your life has purpose, you will get there in the life that Jesus came to give you. And that life is more summed up in a person than it is a path or a a plan. That's a life that a person has for you. He is life. He is your life. And that is a life that you get to daily live in connection with God through the person of Jesus. Decision by decision on Tuesday, as true as Friday, as true as Sunday, step by step, we connect from heaven to earth in a relationship with God. And the gigantic void in our lives the bankruptcy of, am- of, of meaningful ambition starts to be filled up with confidence, with faith, with purpose. Because something that we'll never get around is that there are just always gonna be questions. Always gonna be questions that you and I cannot answer. What, what, like, like why, seems like dangerous thinking, right? But like why God is, why is God? Why that? I don't know. I mean, a lot of people have tried to take it in a different direction. It's like, okay, well, maybe there's no God. Let's figure it out that way. I I have never been able to reverse engineer that. It takes a lot more faith to believe that than believe that there's actually God who always was. Hard to believe. We don't know why God is. We don't know why God made what we made, what he made. We don't know why God allows what he has allowed. We don't know why God wants what God wants. Those are real questions that can mess with us, right? And why the Garden of Eden? And why day six? And then a man? And then a woman? Why? Why? And, and how did Satan come to be Satan and help spoil all the good that God made in the Garden of Eden? Eden? And, and how, was it, how was it so early in creation that Jesus was going to be sent to redeem everything that fell in a garden that was originally good. Why? And, and why did Jesus come when he came? And, and why Bethlehem? Why not Melbourne? Why not Sioux Falls? Like, why? They're all decent questions. And we don't know God's purpose God's purposes as we define them because we will never be able to fit God's mind into ours, will we? Here's what we do know. We do know that whatever God purposes will be and that whatever God does is always right. Can't get around it. And we do know this, is that God is inviting you into a life of being intimately connected to him and eternally grounded in what he is doing. And you know, I believe, I believe that God wants to open the eyes of every person in this room in some way to get comfortable with those eternal realities. People who have been following Jesus for a really long time, we still have this way of closing our eyes to God's purposes at work in what he is doing today in our lives and the people that we love. As well as people who are just at the beginning of trying out Jesus. The Bible is speaking to all of us. He's saying, God, he wants to talk to you. The God that was, is, and always will be. He wants it. He doesn't change. He wants to talk to you. He wants to share his secrets with your heart. <laughs> it's crazy, right? And he wants to assure you of the purposeful life that he is giving, offering us through Jesus. 
Let me give you some ways. I hope they encourage your heart. There is purpose in the new life that he gives you in Christ. The new life he gives you comes through Christ. Ephesians 2.10 says that in Christ, he wants to remake you to be his masterpiece. It says he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned, underline plan today, he planned for us to do long ago. You know, the way he's shaped you, the gifts he's given you, the things that he wants to spark to life in your life, especially since you have met Jesus and trusted Jesus, it's all unique. And listen, he's not shooting from the hip. It says, these are good things he planned to do in you a long time ago. Purpose in the new life he gives you. Purpose in your struggle seasons. James 1 says that whenever trials come, you in a hard season right now, whenever trials and struggles come, we actually can get a little excited on the inside. We can face those trials with great joy. Why? Well, because he says, you know that when your faith is being tested, that's when endurance actually has a chance to grow. And he says, let it grow, for then when your endurance is fully developed, that's when you become perfect and complete, not lacking in anything. In other words, God knows judo. Like God knows... How any evil force sent your way to destroy you, he knows how to absorb, receive, manipulate, and leverage that force for your victory rather than your defeat. He wants that to be an actual thing you experience in your life because he's working on you from the inside out before he's trying to fix everything around you and give you like heaven on earth when he already has heaven in heaven. There's purpose in your struggle seasons. And a more spiritually mature you, a more perfect and complete you, a more perfect and complete character tomorrow always sprouts from gracious endurance in your trials today. There's purpose. It's loaded with purpose. There's purpose in the unfinished middle. You know, we talked about questions, and we, and we have them. They have a way of hovering over us, don't, I, don't they? Uh, well, what's going to happen in the next war, what's going to happen in the next election? What's going to happen if this next treatment doesn't work out for me? What's going to happen when my kids all move out? What's going to happen to them? These things have a way of looming over us. And yet Romans 8.28 says that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and have been called according to his underlined purpose for them. You being called to Christ, loaded with purpose. And there's purpose when you're at a spot in life when everything feels like a dead end. I think back when uh, God's nation was a complete shambles, they had been absolutely decimated. They had been steamrolled uh, by their enemies, Babylon. And God sent his people, who remained, <laughs> a prophet who wasn't very encouraging at first. He kind of poured a lot of lemon juice on the cuts. And he said, by the way, I just want to remind you, you guys so wanted all of this. That's how you behaved. <laughs> you guys were just begging for this to happen. And also, God says, it's not going to clean up anytime soon. Maybe not even in your lifetime. Well, thank you for being truthful, God. And what God also said is this. I know the plans that I have for you. I know them. He says they're plans for good and not for disaster. They are plans to give you a future and a hope. Plans, purpose, plans, purpose. Life to the full means being steadied by the unshakable nature of God in your details. Steadied by the unshakable nature of whatever God determines when he has promised, he's including you, and you end up on the winning side. And that comes down even to the call to the forever purpose that he has put on your life. It reminds me of um, uh, the earliest stage of uh, Courtney and my, Courtney and my uh, marriage. Uh, way simpler times. Do you ever look back to like before you had kids, and you're like, what did... We, how much time and money are sitting on piles and piles, you know, nothing in our couch cushions. Like, it's just one of those eras in your life, right? 
And, and for, Courtney, for Courtney and me, this is a small 1,100 square foot duplex in rural Manuka. It's before kids. I love my kids, but this is before kids. And um, it's like I have to say that. I love my kids, you guys. Um, <laughs> hey, today, Soren, Soren, Soren. It looks like the mini me, six years old today. Six years old today. So give him a little nookie, okay? Um, yay! So this is way before Soren. Uh, and... Uh, Courtney and I had, were in this phase where we would end just about every day uh, sitting to, you know, curled up together on this beige Ikea couch, <laughs> watching at least one hour-long episode of Law & Order SVU. It was all the rage. And we were still, like, doing channels back in that day. And you could find it on, like, multiple channels. And so uh, we would watch at least one hour-long episode, and we, we rooted for our, we loved our detectives, the Detective Benson and Stabler and Finn and, you know, all, all, the whole gang. And every time, we would ride the emotions from the top of the hour until, you know, we're starting to get somewhere and we're starting to solve things and crack the case, and then there's always this unforeseen twist and we go to commercial, and Courtney and I would just look at each other like, what? <laughs> and we, 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 we rode that train, we got on that ride enough times until we finally learned the hack, really two of them. I don't want to ruin law and orders for you, for you, but <laughs> it's pretty much public domain by now. It's been around for, you know, like 83 seasons. So here's the two hacks for law and order SVU is one, you can always count on an eye-widening twist that the writers would write in that always made everything go from certain to suddenly less certain around the 25-minute mark, just before commercial. And you could also count on this second thing as well. You knew that before the hour was up, this too shall pass. And these things would all be solved and resolved. In other words, Courtney and I were steadied when we began trusting the drama less and the writer more. And that's what I love about Christmas. That's what I love about John chapter one. It is such a powerful reminder to our hearts to trust God's purpose even in the midst of our uncertainties. Just as uncertain as it looked for Jesus. I mean, you, you know the story, right? There's a point in his life where his mom and his stepdad relationship was completely rocky, almost fell apart before he came. And, and these two were miles from home when she went into labor. I have some, some moms here who have had that experience. It's terrifying. Miles from anywhere safe. And when she went into labor, they couldn't even pay for a room. And the best they could do is give birth to this baby boy in a stable, like he was laid in an animal food bowl for crying out loud. Uncertain times, that Jesus, that Jesus that we sing about, we sing to, John is reminding us that Jesus is actually alive, eternity past, and is alive into eternity future even in uncertain moments for him, even in the moments when he was dead and in the grave and everything seemed like it was up in the air. That Jesus has love for you. It's why he came to be with us. It's, it's why he came to be like us. He came to relate to us in full and for you to be related to to know that you're understood. You know, I, I want to send us out of here um, with a cool line from the Psalms that I found this week that I think could be a prayer that you lift from the scripture and maybe make it your own in a special way for you. And I want to pray for you. I want to pray for all of us. Can we do that? Uh, here's the line. It's, Psalm it's from Psalm 138. Check this out. It says, The Lord will work out his plans for my life.
And I have to work through some emotion there because I know some of the things that you're trying to work out right now. But here's the prayer. I'm, con I'm confident of this. The Lord will work out his plans for my life for your faithful love, O oh Lord, endures forever. So hey, don't abandon me. For you made me. Hey, why make me if it ends here? Why make me if this isn't going to go to a good place? This is on you more than it is on me. Right? And this is a prayer that's just loaded with surrender. This is a prayer that offers the steering wheel away. And says, okay, you work it out. Doesn't fit, doesn't match. There's not enough. I have no clue what to do next. Looks like a dead end to me. You work it out. Is that a prayer you could pray? All right, let's pray that together. Father, I thank you for the safety that we have found in your presence this morning. It just strikes me how we can just enjoy an atmosphere together as, as your people, singing our guts out how worthy you are, how eternal and how powerful and how present you are. And I don't know that we can fully anticipate how badly we need you to be those things when we turn our attention to where everything looks like it's falling short. And we're frustrated and there's no easy answer. We're asking you to work out your plans for our lives. We like your plans better than our plans. You see more. You know more. You know us better. I don't, moments like these, when I think about how eternal you are, I don't, I don't feel so much like I chose you. I feel like you chose me. You chose us. You showed up. You found us. We couldn't find ourselves. And I, I want to pray for every person that is following Jesus that we, because of what we know, that we will invite you into the uncertainty of our emotions, into the uncertainty of our illnesses, into the uncertainty of our addictions, our shortfalls, our questions. We're asking you to fill our lives with purpose because we can't do that for ourselves. You're the eternal one. This is all about you. You reveal purpose to us. Open our eyes and fill our lives with purpose so that we can walk with confidence, so we can stop second-guessing ourselves, so that we'll be more prone to run back to you when we need to know the next thing. God, we need you to make heavenly sense out of what you are doing here on earth in our lives. We're surrendering it to you when we're caught up in anxiety. We, we need you to give us rest because you have great purposes for our lives. And likewise, when we have given up and we don't see the point anymore, you are a God who can bring our ambitions to life. You give us drive to create good. So we're not done till you're done. We know that the best is yet to come. Teach us life to the full as you define it. And can I give some extra words to anybody in this room? You're hearing all this, you like how it sounds, but you, you gotta say, man, I, I've never stepped into the reality of a relationship with God. And I've kicked the tires on the idea long enough. Today, I'm, I'm just ready to trust Jesus. I want you to know he wants to be trusted that this purpose in this moment for you, there is reasons behind why you're here today, why you feel the way you feel, why you now know what you know. And the fact of the matter is, in time and space, God has said, I want to hear from you. Speak to me and I will hear. So here's what you can tell God. If this is the truth of your heart, use my words as your own. God, hey, I want to admit I'm far from you. It's easy for me to believe that's because I'm a screwer-upper. I'm a sinner. I've made a lot of mistakes when I was trying hard. I would have made a lot of mistakes when I was trying to be selfish, but I'm certainly not like you. And if it's left up to me, I won't end up where you are. 
And, and that is not what I want. Today, I wanna get to you by the way that you directed me to get to you, which is you sending us Jesus. I'm putting my trust in him more than me. I want him to save me from my sin because he paid for me to be washed free of all my sin when he died for me on the cross. When he came and did what he didn't need to do for himself. I'm ready to believe. He told me it's for me. Okay, then it was for me and I'm taking it. I'm taking the deal. And I receive the gift of eternal life in Christ in a relationship with you where I can look forward to seeing you face to face. And I can know that now, even now in this life, I have a new heart and a new life in Christ. You're my savior now and I want you to be my Lord. Because if the galaxies are more about you than they are about me, I'm ready for my life to do the same thing. Show me the way through. We all pray these things in the awesome name of Jesus. Amen.